Tonight's top European Union stories from the Unit UK include The European Union hasn't made any difference at all to Britain's trade. EU launches Milk Market Observatory. And Italy asks the European Union for more time to meet deficit targets. British business needs to be at the heart of the EU. Plus, the non-debate by Clegg and a valiant attempt by Farage. Now, Richard Littlejohn on Twitter asked three excellent questions about our film Leaving the European Union and see our video library segment of tonight's show for our responses. It's Thursday, the 8th of May. I'm Rick Timmis and this is the Unit Nightly News. First up, that story from our website, theunituk.com. The European Union hasn't made any difference at all to Britain's trade. One of the standard arguments about Britain's membership of the European Union is that it's vital that we stay in because so much of our trade is with other European Union countries. Implicit in this is the claim that this is a result of our being in the EU. The dropping of trade restrictions resulting from the single market rules, for example. Uh, The problem with this argument is that it depends upon empirical claim that Britain's trade with the European Union countries has increased since the foundation of that single market. And it turns out that that doesn't seem to be true. Over the 40 years of EU membership, for all the costs and obligations incurred, for all the treaties negotiated and for all the immense amounts of time and anguish spent arguing about various aspects of the EU project, the proportion of UK exports going to the UK's future EU partners has changed hardly at all, he said. While the share of UK exports to fellow EU members has been virtually stable, the share going to non-members in Europe has risen steadily, leading one to suspect that both insider advantages and outsider disadvantages are imaginary. Now, this article goes into more depth in establishing the arguments, and of course we'll have more on this topic on EU trade later in today's show. EU launches Milk Market Observatory. Farm leaders have welcomed the launch of a European watchdog to keep an eye on the more volatile post-quota milk market. EU Agriculture Commissioner Dacian Kiolos unveiled the European Milk Market Observatory in Brussels earlier this week, calling it a crucial tool in the run-up to quota abolition on 1st of April 2015. The observatory will gather accurate data from across Europe on prices, production and consumption on its website and produce market analysis and forecasts. The European Commission will use this information to publish reports to guide future policy. A board of 40 dairy industry experts will meet quarterly to discuss developing trends, with the first meeting scheduled for 27th of May. Now, NFU Chief Dairy Advisor Rob Newbury said the announcement was a relief as it was not coupled with new market management controls. Fascinating. I was only talking about milk quotas as an example to support one of my positions last week. Now, what I find really interesting is that for 20 plus years, the milk quota system punished small farmers. And at the same time, the big agri corporations ran around buying up as many failing small farm businesses as they could lay their hands on. Now that those big agri firms have control, the EU milk quota system gets dropped. On another topic, it's all well and good wheeling out the office jockeys with the shiny bottoms from the EU and NFU, peddling the positive rhetoric. My question is, what's the real feeling on the ground with dairy farmers who are having to deal with all this? Now, we'd love to hear from you if you own or work on a farm. How is this legislative change affecting you? And what is your take on the EU milk quota system? Italy asks EU for more time to meet deficit target. Italy on Thursday asked the European Union to push back a deadline for cutting its public deficit to 2016, days after France reportedly tried and failed to get another extension. Finance Minister Pierre Carlo Podon said record unemployment and weak growth 
exasperated measures to pay tens of billions of euros of overdue arrears to companies. We're making it difficult to cut Italy's towering debt. Despite the positive signs, the economic recovery is still fragile and the situation in the job market is still difficult, he told Parliament. To help the payment of civil service debts, the government intends to make use of the exception procedure, which allows a delay in meeting the deficit target, he said. Prime Minister Matteo Renzi's new government is struggling to boost growth in the Eurozone's third largest economy, which is exiting the worst recession since World War II. Now, the government cut its growth forecast for this year to 0.8% and raised its 2014 deficit target from 2.5% of output to 2.6%. Padone said corrective action and privatisations would rapidly reduce public debt from next year, putting Italy back on schedule to meet its long-term EU-agreed target of a debt-to-GDP ratio of 60%. The Eurozone has painted itself into a corner. The problem being faced now is a deflationary spiral. Economic output continues to fall. Unemployment is so high that wage compression has shrunk the buying power of those in work. And deflation is the antithesis of inflation. But the symptoms on economy and society are the same. Poverty. Of course, this all lends itself brilliantly to driving the privatisation of everything and anything. In short, that is an exercise in stripping the balance sheet of each member state. So, where are we headed? Well, a federal United States of Europe. The politicians will, of course, say they have no choice, that it is too late, that the economic climate gives them no choice but to integrate into a single federal union. We are in the end game of this project, and those that want to retain their democracy and ability to control and govern themselves need to up their game, because right now, they're losing the battle. British business needs to be at the heart of the EU. With just over two weeks to go until European elections, political parties of all colours are setting out their position to voters. And we too, as business leaders, must clearly state our case for a reformed EU, said the CBI. Now, in recent weeks, the CBI has been conducting a tour of European cities, meeting key political and business figures in Berlin, Rome and Brussels. Despite naysayers' predictions that we can't reform the EU and the UK lacks influence in European corridors of power, we were struck by the growing hunger for change, change that could boost competitiveness and deliver jobs and growth across the continent, they said. When it comes to business, the world is getting smaller as capital travels across the globe at the click of a button and workers become increasingly mobile. Meanwhile, regional trading blocks bring once rival nations together in a common cause of delivering economic growth for all. The EU has been central to prosperity in peace in Europe over many decades, which perhaps we sometimes take for granted. I love statements like this, that the EU has been responsible for peace. It seems to me that many of the ascended states from the East came to the EU as a result of war and conflict, just like the protagonist in the school playground that incites conflict between others and then holds their hands up refuting all responsibility. Our roving reporter yesterday, Soviet Bear, would deeply disagree, arguing that the EU has been responsible for inciting the conflict in the Ukraine. The non-debate by Clegg and a valiant attempt by Farage. More from your letters post our table talk discussion about the Farage-Clegg debate. Today we have a letter from Roger Wright Morris, who says, Dear Rick, however, whilst Nigel Farage tried hard to debate as an adult intellectual on issues and facts, it was a shame that Nick Clegg declined to do either but, like a chameleon, followed the idiotic nature of Prime Minister's questions and the floral dance of the Prime Minister. They would both look good on the high streets of Helston. Clegg was a disgrace to free speech and the electorate. He waffles like the Prime Minister, and when one seeks to learn, there is the offertory of a void with hollow promises. So, the issues. 1. If directives, statutory instruments and other ultra-UK Parliament diktats from Brussels are counted the same, then, on the basis that the UK Parliament can do nothing about it, we need to know, is it 7%, the liar issue, 14%, ditto, or 50%, 70%, 80%, 
84% or more. Now, I suspect that as these diktats invade all aspects of our lives, the percentage is nearer 50 to 65% of United States of Europe diktats. Point two is that United States of Europe battle groups, a word not used except within the EU army, I suspect. But Nigel Farage well knows that these are at the command of the EU, subject to the approval of the 28 states and the 29th, i.e. the new country known as the Commission. So, Nick Clegg was economic with the actualite. The powers over the battle groups will become firmer, as is the EU mode of practice. Point three, exports. Clegg, as ever, is wrong. Less than 50% about 45 to 46% and declining of UK exports go to the EU and the exports to the rest of the world are increasing. Well done, Nigel Farage. Point four, employment. The jobs and prosperity follow the exports. So see point three above. Clegg, wrong again. There may be exceptions, but the issues raised by car manufacturing may be one, but the workers seem split, it seems. Point five, clubs. The old-fashioned tariff barrier EU is outdated. Nigel Farage was right. Clegg is blinded by loyalty to the tyrannical non-democratic EU. Point six. Energy. Nigel Farage was spot on with the anti-competitive carbon EU policy, which is so costly that it drives the UK businesses into a non-competitive position in world trade. Hence the tariff barriers of the EU are needed. Point seven cost of the superstate. So what is the relevance of the number of EU employees being equal to those engaged by Derbyshire County Council? There is no reference to the huge size of the Ashton Empire, the ridiculous costs of Strasbourg, the expenses and real gravy train of MEPs and all commissioners, etc, etc. £55 million is what we pay out each day. What the net loss per day is, we know not, but the sums are in need of immediate cessation. Roger goes into even further depths with additional points of view, and you can read the whole letter in our letters section, links of which are below. Now, a big, big thank you to Roger, and indeed everyone who has written to us so far, and I'll keep working through your letters in this show, so please do keep them coming. Now, Sue and I were cucking up a storm on social media yesterday. There was much discussion about leaving the European Union and whether or not that was within the power of the MEPs to enact. As with most EU topics these days, we have such an archive of film, letters, articles, e-books, links that we can usually cover the how-tos and wherefores. And that is certainly the case here. In the film section of our video library, we have the short film Leaving the European Union. Now, this video looks at the existing mechanisms for trade and membership of the EU. It considers the alternatives and demonstrates a potential method for how the UK might go about leaving. Now, at Rich underscore Little John took umbrage with us on Twitter and began his arguments fairly simply, stating that what we were saying was falsehood, lies, and that the film was a joke and a fraud. Well, here at the unit, we love to hear people's opinions, good or bad, and indeed everyone has their right to their opinion, but that doesn't always make it valid. So we pressed our man, Rich underscore Little John, to support his statements with some evidence, and he came back to us with the following questions, which I'm excited and delighted to tell you about. Question. Why don't you mention that EFTA, or EFTA, members have to adopt almost all EU legislation? Well, we do make mention of this, and we also talk about the acquis communautaire. By the EU, none agree to the acquis, the massive EU book of rules. This is a model Britain could easily copy. Switzerland, Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein are members of the 50-year-old European Free Trade Association, EFTA, of which Britain was a founder member before joining the EU. Unlike the EU, EFTA is not a customs union in which members surrender control to the centre. Each EFTA member conducts its own trade policies and sits and votes at the World Trade Organisation in its own right. 
EFTA, or EFTA, the European Free Trade Association, is an option that the UK could adopt, but one which requires the acquis communautaire, the massive book of EU rules, to be adopted. Now, in our film, we do state that Britain could do this, and we also show how Britain could exit to be a completely sovereign, independent state, which could negotiate trade deals freely across the globe. And we would be in no worse position than anyone else in the rest of the world who negotiate their own arrangements. And of course, we could choose whether or not we would join EFTA. Question. Why not mention that Norway pays into the EU? Well, yes, it does. And that is part of their trade deal. But they aren't subject to the domestic laws and regulations that we in the UK are, and nor do they pay the considerable amounts that the UK does. However, mentioned above, an independent sovereign UK would not be obliged to adhere to any arrangement that it had not entered into wholly in its own volition. There are no options open to the UK other than EU membership. Here are just three. A radical option for the UK would be to withdraw from the EU completely and under the World Trade Organization umbrella to unilaterally declare genuine free trade with the countries of the world, including the remaining EU. Following such withdrawal, the UK ought to consider making the Commonwealth the main focus and vector of its global trade policy. Question. Why not mention that the UK is free to trade with whoever it wants? The EU does not stop that. Well, Britain cannot negotiate a trade deal with anybody. That privilege now resides with the EU. The UK hasn't signed a trade deal since 1973. So, for example, recently David Cameron went to China, allegedly on a trade mission, but he didn't sign any trade agreements because he can't. Question. Why don't you mention the non-tariff barriers to EU-US trade and talk about the TEC? Indeed, the ground is shifting all the time. The EU is no slouch when it comes to creating new rules, regulations, laws and directives. Some are good and some are bad, of course. The purpose and core objective of the film was to demonstrate a. that the UK can quite legitimately leave the EU if it so wishes and b. to demonstrate a mechanism as to how this might be achieved. In respect to non-tariff trade barriers and the TEC, well, this is a big topic and one we want to investigate further, as well as looking in more depth at the TTIP partnership treaty, which in itself is causing much controversy. And we will be doing a special table talk show to discuss these aspects. The single crucial point to remain focused upon is to ensure that all the people of Britain have a clear choice about whether they are governed from Westminster or from Brussels, something which they have never been asked. Here at the unit, our job is simple. Present as much information, news, articles and facts about the European Union, its institutions, its actions at home and abroad, and how this affects you, the people. Non-political and non-partisan, just the facts. Links to our film, Leaving the European Union, are below. Now, remember to visit our website, theunituk.com, for all the very latest news. You can find our page on Facebook by searching for The Unit UK, all one word. Join our community on Google+, Plus, where you can interact with us, voice your opinions, and post comments about our stories, and even get involved in the shows. And for all the latest tweets as they happen, then follow us on Twitter, at The E Unit. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm... Rick Timmis, reporting for the unit, Nightly News. I'll see you soon.